so thank you for your patience. Today I'm going to be talking about two separate data sets, one that was collected before the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, another collected afterwards, and I'm looking at zooplankton communities within these data sets and linking it to environmental variability. I'll sometimes say pre-DWH or pre-spill, those are synonymous, same thing with post. That's a live feed. <laughs> cool. Okay, so what are zooplankton? It's a characterization, zo being animal, planktos being the Greek word for drifter. They exhibit a variety of eating lifestyles. They can uh, prey on zooplankton cells. I'll wait. I'll just turn down the feedback. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, they can play, prey direct, directly on zooplankton cells um, and are herbivorous. They can eat other zooplankton, are carnivorous, and most are opportunistic omnivores. They can live their entire lives as zooplankton, such as copepods, or a lot of animals, such as important commercial fishery or fishes and recreational fishes, such as this marlin, start off as a plankton, they graduate out or morph into nectonic phase. So zooplankton communities are influenced by a variety of complex interactions, be it with the physical, chemical, or biological environment, as well as the physiology and behavior of themselves. Um, some important metrics for understanding these communities are measuring their abundance as well as community composition to understand changes in the communities as it relates to the environment. They serve as a really important link connecting energy captured from the sun through photosynthesis by phytoplankton and bringing that energy to higher trophic levels so they're really important for sustaining marine fisheries. Because they eat phytoplankton, or eat animals that do eat phytoplankton, larger populations of phytoplankton can support greater populations of zooplankton. So the extent and timing of phytoplankton blooms are impacted by a variety of processes, including temperature, salinity, winds and currents, turbidity, as well as nutrients. These nutrients can be recycled in the upper water column, or they can be introduced through river discharge or wind-driven upwelling. So since these impact chlorophyll and phytoplankton blooms, it therefore also impacts zooplankton. Our subregion has three major, or our study region has three major subregions which exhibit transitional gradients of water properties. The continental shelf is heavily coastal influenced with river discharge and upwelling events. There's a lot of nutrients here, so a lot of zooplankton high abundances are seen. The continental slope is more transitional and serves as a zone between the shelf and the more ligotrophic open ocean or oceanic gulf. Our study region has a lot of river inputs, but by far the largest is the Mississippi River. It has the greatest volume, the greatest um, input of nutrients, and these other rivers mimic the discharge patterns of the Mississippi River. And so the seasonal variation within a year is pretty predictable. The discharge follows snowmelt in the United States interior, so the height of discharge is spring with lowest discharge summer through fall. However, interannual um, variability oops, is super high between this river. Um, as you can see at the bottom graph here, all these lines are different years, and you can see that it changes quite a lot. So the Mississippi River watershed drains over 40% of the United States, including one-third of all of the corn grown in the entire world is in this watershed, much of which is heavily treated with fertilizers. So this unused fertilizer is nutrients, and when it's brought to the Gulf, it can sustain high blood events of phytoplankton, which is seen in red in this satellite image. And the properties of the water are strikingly different from the ligotrophic Gulf. The flow of the Mississippi water into the Gulf is controlled by a number of locks and diversion systems. Sometimes they're open to aid in mitigation in the face of a hazardous event, such was done in 2010 um, to help aid in mitigation of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and then again the following year in 2011 uh, during the historic Mississippi River flood. So once that water enters the Gulf, it's subjected to prevailing winds. Winds play a really important role in influencing the waters and influencing zooplankton and plankton communities by promoting not only upwelling, but also controlling the morphology of this river plume. It can bring water to different areas that might have had less nutrients, thereby changing the plankton community structure in that particular region. 
So in springtime, westward winds and northward currents prevail. And moving into summer, those winds will weaken and they'll switch. And there's a greater instance of eastward prevailing winds. And through Ekman transport, southward currents pulling water off the continental shelf and driving wind-driven upwelling. So in addition to these natural environmental factors, anthropogenic oil spills can also um, influence zooplankton. Zooplankton can experience physical or biochemical harm when exposed to oil. And some laboratory studies have shown copepods exposed to oil have decreased feeding ability, reproduction, as well as swimming ability. Um, this brings us to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. It occurred in April of 2010, and for nearly three months, between 3 and 4.9 million barrels of oil were, was released into this ecosystem. It was the largest accidental spill in history, and the surface expression um, at one point was the size of Oklahoma. So we also know through isotopic studies that oil from this spill made its way into the planktonic food web likely through processes such as direct ingestion, so animals eating the oil directly, or through trophic transfer of things in the microbial loop, such as noctiluca, um, eating oil, which then zooplankton in turn will consume. So the goal of my study was to explore the effects of the natural, seasonal, and interannual environmental variability on zooplankton community structure in the NIGAM, or Northeast Gulf of Mexico, and to determine if we can identify the effects of deepwater horizon oil spill on zooplankton communities by first establishing this baseline and comparing it to the time after the spill. I have four major classes of hypotheses, um, and I looked at environmental and zooplankton communities separately for each. So first I looked at seasonal differences, so between spring and summer, and then I dug into each season between years, so interannual spring, interannual summer, and then lastly, I combined these data sets and then I um, assessed whether there was a significant impact of the oil spill on zooplankton beta diversity or their percent composition and abundances between pre and post. A little visualization of the last slide here. Um, so I have four data sets, environmental and zooplankton, and I looked at each of these three things. And then lastly, I combined them. Um, if it has a yellow background, I'm talking about pre-spill data, and blue background, I'm talking about the post-spill data set. And in the top left corner, if there is a sun, I'm talking about environmental conditions. And if there's zooplankton, we're talking about the biological communities. So a little bit of background. Taxa is a catch-all term to describe any taxonomic level of animals. Um, based on our methods, we had some animals down to genus, and others were just a functional group. So I'm using taxa a lot here. And two underpinning principles of ecology is richness, which looks at the number of taxa present, so composition, and diversity, which looks at not only the composition, but also the abundance at the sample site, and this is typically an index. However, for my study, I use something called beta diversity. This looks at the variation in both the composition and abundance of taxa, but among sample sites within a sampling unit. So a visualization of that is, say we have these three sites, and they have animals in each of them, and the data is down here on the left. You can look at each site, how it relates to another site, by um, studying its resemblance. And so I have a resemblance matrix here, and as you can see, site 3 compared to site 2 is identical. So it has a value of 1 or 100% in common, whereas site 1 to 3 has nothing in common, scores a 0, and most sites will fall somewhere in between here. Moving into methods, on the left, this is a graphic of my study region with the surface expression of the oil superimposed onto it. The red is days most oiling, and that black dot is the Deepwater Horizon spill site. As you can see, all of the other dots are my sampling locations, and that falls within this extent of the oil spill. In yellow is pre-spill or pre-DWH. These are all CMAP samples that we were able to borrow and we selected these stations based on the locations of all the blue samples, so the light blue triangles and the dark blue circles, which are all post-spill or USF. And we have a data set spanning from 2005 to 2014, spring and summer. Um, this heart is where I'm from. I'm, 
I am really grateful to be able to study a system that I care so much about. I, I remember the day that this happened, and I'm sure as everyone remembers, the day was something they care about is in duress. Um, I was I was really uh, motivated to want to learn more about this, and I'm really fortunate that I was able to. So uh, back to those subregions, the data represented in each is, as you can see in blue, all these subregions were sampled, um, and we have samples for the post spill. However, we have some gaps in the data where the continental shelf is missing the spring and oceanic is missing summer. So just something to keep in mind. As for the methods, the zooplankton were collected identically on the boat. They were collected using a bongo tow that was towed down to 200 meters or um, two to three meters off the floor if it was shallower than 200 meters. Um, however, one major difference is that the pre-spill zooplankton was processed using a really cool piece of equipment called the hydroptic zooscan, whereas the post-spill data was um, analyzed or assessed using the more traditional microscopy of identification and enumeration. So um, about the hydroptic zooscan, we prepare a sample by creating a subsample using a Folsom splitter and then we extract the animals that are larger than 10 millimeters and that's a baby puffer fish. Um, and then using our naked eyes, we look at the scanner and we use these toothpick items to spread the things apart. I scan only with my hair up, but I knew a picture was being taken. So I <laughs> hook my hair down. Um, but down here, this is what it looks like, these little animals that we're spreading apart with these toothpicks. Um, we take an image, and then if any of these two animals are touching, we can digitally separate them on a computer. And then we're training the computer through those images to build a taxonomic library. So up top here is an example of what this library looks like. It's folders filled with pictures. And by visually validating how well our computer did, we're training our computer to do better, um, thus processing the sample. The pro of this method is that it's relatively quick, especially once you get your training set um, up and ready and smart. However, oh, also you can divide labor. So you, if you have a lot of people in the lab, they can all do different sections of this. However, one of the cons is that it loses some detail. The computer is smarter when there's more general groupings, more taxa-based. Um, and also it relies on visual dependence to look at these animals um, and try to spread them apart before you take a scan. Also, some things like marine snow, which can be translucent in the scanning bed, don't always show up translucent in a scan and can skew some of the images. So uh, the microscope, we also split this down to a subsample, and then these are shipped out to Don Ottram at the University of Rhode Island, where by a microscope she identified these down to genus species, where I then took all these groups and then collapsed them into uh, the same groupings of the more coarse zooscan so they can match up. This has more detail, it has more diversity, but one of the cons is that it takes a lot of time and it's labor intensive and a lot of technical skill. So in conjunction with that, I had an environmental data set. These sea surface parameters listed were collected at the same time as the zooplankton. And I augmented that data set with river discharge that I gathered from the USGS and wind and current data from NOAA buoys, residual products, and satellite data. Um, I assessed each of these data sets using Euclidean distances on normalized data for the environment and Bray Curtis dissimilarity on 4 3 transformed zooplankton abundances. I used a variety of multivariate tests to conduct analysis. Some of these looked at total variability, such as uh, PCOA and PCA, and some looked at the differences between groups, such as Permanova and CAP. Um, each of these have associated biplot vector, which I'll show in a bit, and those are effectively animals or variables that explain what we're seeing in the ordination. And I selected the zooplankton to use in those ordinations so it's less messy through Simper and Invel. So an orientation to ordinations, what you have here is an empty ordination, and you'll have a title in the top. If it's a cap, I'm representing the variability between groups. And if it's a PCA or a PCOA, we're representing the total variability between all of the samples. The X direction or axis one will explain most of the variability and the second most variability in multivariate space will be explained here on the Y direction. So mostly the X is what you wanna look at. It's typically more important. And then the sample names are superimposed onto um, this multivariate space. 
and those samples that are closer together are more similar than samples that are further apart. The associated biplot vector, um, longer vectors closer to the x-axis are typically more important for explaining the variation seen in that ordination. So um, those samples are superimposed in your mind on the biplot vector and these arrows that are close to the x and longer, most important, such as this, temperature and river discharge. Now moving into the results. So first we're looking at if um, there's significant seasonal difference in environmental conditions between spring and summer. And I know you can't really see the sample names here, but what's important is that blue is spring and red is summer, and that these groups are falling out pretty distinctly differently, and they're, uh, therefore spring and summer are significantly different. And what's driving these differences is that in spring, there's a greater Mississippi River discharge, there's stronger winds, and there's northward currents and prevailing westward winds. But there's also higher salinity, which is weird because if you have high discharge, you'd think you'd have fresher water. So that's something to keep in mind and I'll circle back to. And looking at summer, what's driving the seasonal difference is that summer has higher temperature. So um, pre on the left, post on the right, respectively, we can reject the null for both of them. The seasonal differences based on the environment were significantly different. Now moving on to the plankton. Again, we can see a really distinct difference in these seasonal communities and what's driving these is that, in general, there's lower abundances of taxa in spring. And spring also had no significant, significant indicator animals, whereas in summer, we had a handful of significant indicators. So they showed up more in summer and at most sites in summer, and they, in general, had greater abundances. And one of these significant indicators was centropogies. This showed up both before the spill and after and proved to be a really important animal in this study, um, so I'm glad it's still there after the spill. So um, coming back to that salinity thing I had mentioned, so if you remember, in springtime, westward winds prevail, uh, creating northward currents, keeping this water tied up on the shelf. And so down here on the left, that's the Mississippi River Birdfoot Delta. That's where the water's coming in. And due to these winds, it's often not even entering our study region. So we can have high spring discharge, but depending on the winds, it's not even impacting where we were sampling. Whereas in summer, you can get weaker winds, and this river water can now enter our study region, and water that was tied up on the shelf can be pulled off the shelf into slope and oceanic stations, therefore making centropogies prevalent throughout the study area more than it was in spring and a significant indicator. So this is an underpinning principle of lots of results that we found, um, as you'll see. So for both of pre and post, we can also reject that the plankton communities weren't significantly different. Digging now into each season separately, we're looking at spring between years. Um, each year here is represented in a different color. And I want to point out that I did test between different years before putting this PCOA up, but these graphs do a better job of explaining what's happening here, and that's why I use them. Um, and even though there's a lot of dispersion here in the y direction, it's accounting for far less variability than what we see in the x. And what's going on in that x direction is there's a really strong annual signal of environmental conditions for both data sets. Um, Although no pairwise differences were significant in the pre-spill, all of the post-spill years were significantly different based on the environment. And we think that's happening because we have far better sample sizes in the post, as you can tell by these sample numbers, in the pre, and we just didn't have enough samples to be powerful enough for that test. Um, so what's driving those interannual differences? Uh, it's no surprises here, Mississippi River water drives a lot of annual variation along with westward winds and southward winds in addition to chlorophyll. So um, what's interesting is although we have these annual groupings, we still do have some stations that deviate substantially from their respective years. And some examples of this is spring 2008 and 2009. This is an open ocean station, but it's nearest the Mississippi River discharge. Um, Birdfoot Delta, as well as in spring 2011 at the continental shelf, we saw some weird environmental conditions. Um, so what's driving those guys is spring 2008 and 9. There was 
strong or weak southward winds or currents, so water coming southward out of the river, and high chlorophyll, so potentially a river signal here, um, as well as in springtime 2011, the opposite was true. There was really strong winds, uh, but they had a northward and eastward wind component, so eastward and southward currents, which is um, conducive to wind-driven upwelling. Also, that year had high river discharge. Whereas 2012 was an anomalously low river discharge year and had southward wind components. So for the pre-spill spring interannual, we cannot reject the null. There was no significant interannual differences, but we can for post. Looking at the zooplankton in spring, so there's, despite this somewhat weak annual signal, um, no two spring years were significantly different from each other. However, what we did see were these pretty prevalent sub-regional groupings um, where continental slope stations fall out separately from oceanic and which also fall out separately from shelf. However, um, sometimes continental slope and oceanic stations can overlap, which we saw in both the pre and the post. And in post where continental shelf was visited, we saw that had the highest variability between years. So what is driving these uh, sub-regional groupings based on the zooplankton communities? There was greater variability in taxa at continental shelf and slope stations relative to oceanic, so more variability closer to the shore, and greater abundances of many taxa closer to shore as well. This is particularly true for centropodes and temera, which are both river-associated animals. They're marine copepods, but they've been found often um, in or around river discharge, making them river associated. And euphalids and lucutia were at higher abundances at um, slope and oceanic stations, which we saw in both the pre as well as the post. So those are still there. That's good. So some stations, again, like we saw in the environment, stand out in zooplankton. And what we are seeing here is there's greater abundances of miscellaneous decapods associated with that high chlorophyll and southward currents. Um, plus, 2008 was a historically high river discharge year. So it's very likely that decapods, which can be found in the open ocean, but are mostly estuarine species, um, are coming out of that river and being found at these stations. Um, 2011 was a really crazy year. There was a super high amount of centropogies. It was nine times higher than centropogies found in 2012. And what was driving uh, 2012 to be so different, not only this lack of centropogies, but it had overall a really low abundance of salps. So a little bit more about salps, because they're super neat. They pump their bodies to feed on phytoplankton and they can reproduce asexually. So when you see a salp, it's a lot of times associated with a really big bloom um, and they can bloom very quickly, they can respond really quickly. So even though on average 2012 was a really low discharge year, the week that we sampled just a couple days before there was a pulse of water that was entered into the continental shelf region here. So although 2012 overall had really low zooplankton abundances, what might have happened was that with this new pulse of river water, it um, helped a phytoplankton bloom grow and these salps responded really quickly. And they don't do well in high nutrient environments because if you have too many phytoplankton cells, it'll clog their bodies. Um, so this is an example of something really small and short happening with these large environmental variability. And is a testament to how variable the system is depending on what scale you look at it. Um, that's when I was supposed to say that. <laughs> So uh, again, we can't reject the null that interannual spring years were different, probably based on limited sample sizes. Um, but the same is true for the post. We didn't see significant interannual differences, but we did see some strong sub-regional variability. Looking now at summer, um, for the environment, again, a lot of spread in this Y direction, but only around 11% and 7% respectively. So what's important here is in this X direction, and again, we can see these really strong annual groupings 
and there's really high interannual variability of the environmental conditions in summer for the post. However, 2010, the spill year was not significantly different based on the environment from 2013. Um, so it wasn't actually a really weird year overall on average from other years in our data set. Um, what was driving these interannual differences? Again, it was the interannual variability of the Mississippi River discharge. There was southward currents and temperature in the pre-spill pre data set. And for the post-spill, it was just everything else. Basically, this environment's super variable, and all these variables contribute to the variability we see in zooplankton and we see in interannual differences. Um, 2010, I want to point out, it did have a continental shelf um, strong winds, and it was a high river discharge year. So again, cannot reject null, but now for summer, we can reject the null. There were significant interannual differences um, for the environment. So for the summer of zooplankton communities, we can again see this really strong sub-regional grouping. So there are a lot of consistencies between data sets. Um, the continental shelf groups separately from the slope and oceanic. And remember, this is the one that's interacting most with river water and then has the highest variability at the shelf. Whereas slope and oceanic can be different, but they can also have overlap. Um, and then what's really cool is these circles inside is even with overlap, there's still a pretty strong annual signal at these slope and oceanic stations. And based on pairwise testing, there was high interannual variability of the zooplankton communities in summer. But interestingly, NS is non-significant. 2010 was not different from any other year. And that was the spill year. So we would suspect to see a signal if it was a really big signal, and we didn't. Um, driving these differences is, again, greater variability of taxa nearer to shore and greater abundances of taxa closer to shore, and particularly for the Centropodes, river-associated animal, as well as Ketognaths, which are my favorite. Um, <laughs> these are all fangs coming out of the side of its face. It's a carnivorous animal, and it's just a supreme predator. <laughs> Um, but at the more offshore regions, we saw higher leucutia and euphazids. So again, like we saw in the environment, we can have some stations that seem to deviate or be unique. Remember we saw that these stations were different in spring for the environment. Well, they were a little different for summer as well. Um, in 2010, there was a high abundance of centropogies. In 2011, there was a relatively high abundance of centropogies, but also really high abundance of cladacerins, as well as temera. Um, so all of those animals are also river associated. There are marine cladacerins, but there's also a ton of freshwater cladacerins that you can find in the continental shelf because they made their way from estuaries. So in 2010, we had strong southwest winds and high river discharge. There's also a paper that came out in 2013 that talked about how the 2010 winter was a really strange winter. There was some of the largest snow events on record, and that made for a really early season of river discharge. So in March, which predates the oil spill by an entire month, there was an anomalously large um, Mississippi River discharge plume and associated with weak winds, and it was able to spread and make its way all the way into our study region and was a really unique year based on the environment <coughs> before the spill even occurred anyways. So we think that in association with that, that set up a situation that fueled a really large zooplankton population, um, and centropogy seems to be associated, especially with high river discharge, so possibly not oil and more likely natural variability. Whereas 2011, which was the year after the spill, maybe we'd see some signal from the spill. You know, maybe the oil can act as a nutrient in the microbial loop. Um, we've seen instances of higher chlorophyll because of the spill. Um, but based on the environment, it also seems like it could just be natural as well. Similar to 2010, there was a spring setup, and we saw that in the data set that I have already showed a couple slides ago. There was a lot of discharge. There was wind-driven upwelling, favorable winds, and there was already large abundances or high abundances from the spring that just carried out possibly to summer. So was it oil signal or natural variability? 
based on the environment and the fact that these continental shelf stations are the farthest stations from the spill site in general, but they're the closest to river discharge, it's very likely that it's natural variability, not the oil at all. So um, we can reject, we cannot reject the null for pre-spill, again, probably due to limited sample size. However, we can reject the null. There is a lot of interannual variability based on the environment in summer, a lot to do probably with winds and um, river discharge. So last, what I did was I looked at these data sets separately, largely because they were processed using different methods. So I said, whatever, let's go ahead and try it. They were different methods, but let's combine the data sets to see if we can notice any big signals going on. So first, I looked at the environmental, wait, hang on, put a pin in what I just said, because Josh wants to hear this part. Um, so based on the distance bis business-based redundancy analysis, this is saying how much of X variation in the environment explained the variation we saw in the beta diversity. For the pre-spill, um, we didn't see any significant results, and this likely due to sample sizes, possibly. However, the amount of environment that explains variability in the zooplankton was super high and significant for the post-spill. Uh, 77 percent and 73 for spring and summer respectively significantly explained the variability seen in the zooplankton and the significant explanatory variables for that were chlorophyll and Mississippi River discharge. So that's really cool. Um, we're linking the environment here and it's speaking a really cool story. Now let's go back to what I was saying before. Um, I combined these data sets and even though they're different methods, we looked to see what was happening. So what you can see here is that the green is all post-spill and yellow is all pre-spill and it looks like they're falling out pretty separately. Um, however, the dispersions were not significantly different so there are a lot of similarities and one group isn't more different within itself than another. Um, but what we think is happening here is that there's just a lot more variability in the post-spill data set and there's a lot greater abundances in the post-spill data set. And the same thing happened for summer. These communities are similar. They have or non significantly different dispersions. However, all these arrows are pointing towards these green way more than yellow. So is this a huge signal that we never saw before that we're now seeing that we combine data sets? Um, I don't think so. I actually think that it's just a limitation of the methodology. So the ZOSCAN is really cool, it's fast, and it's innovative, and it does really well in some animals, like this example of a ketognaf. However, other animals, the computer doesn't do as great a job knowing this is centropogies. It thinks it's a calanoid, which is an order. So, you know, loss of detail that I talked about. And then other animals, um, due to things like the limitations of visual preparation, as you can see, each of these um, circles are circling around a copepod that was underneath or stuck around or just not seen on top of another animal. And when you get to that digital separation phase, you can't actually separate it out without ruining one of the animals. So in general, this is um, potentially, a, you know, we're underestimating the abundance of some of these animals and we're losing detail of some of these animals in the ZOSCAN method versus microscopy. And maybe beta diversity is just not the best metric to compare these because that's what our results are seeming to say. So to try to overcome this limitation, instead of looking at beta diversity, um, we looked at the percent composition. So assuming that the limitation of identification was conserved throughout that pre-spill data set, maybe that percent that animal makes up of the overall community would be changing if there was an impact of a spill between pre and post, or the percent of that community would not be changing if it was not impacted. Um, so moving into some of those results, this is spring results. We chose these things called conspicuous groups. So these are animals that the zoo scan does a pretty good job of identifying. Uh, we would have some of the least limitations there. Bold means that the um, percent composition increased from pre to post, and italics means that the percent composition decreased. So digging into these, oh, also this is the oceanic subregion. So although it's spring, which is not when the spill occurred, 
um, the oceanic subregion is where the spill occurred. So if we see a big signal, that's likely we're going to see the loudest signal that was the most oiled and most under duress. So while some animals, such as Lucutia, go down, um, others went up, but they were still present, and copepods are really variable anyways. So when we packed all this together and looked at total copepods, there's actually a overall decrease of copepods between pre and post. So, okay, maybe copepods were impacted by the oil spill. So we saw the amount of that community decreased, but did the abundance, because if the abundance decreased in addition to that percent composition. All right, yeah, maybe that's a signal from an oil spill, one that you wouldn't have seen by just looking at patterns and not direct comparison. However, in general, the abundance between pre and post for copepods didn't actually change. So the system's already super variable, and we can look at fine resolution, but overall, the abundances didn't seem to change. It's not really a conclusive story. And then everything else was not significantly different between pre and post. So there's no detectable big trend or impact from the oil spill that we saw in this most heavily oiled region. Um, so yeah, remember I had all those Centropogies examples. Maybe there's something happening specifically with Centropogies. Also, this is summer when the spill occurred. We had oil present in the water column in 2010, um, but Centropogies didn't actually change based on the percent composition between pre and post either. And some animals did change. These copepods went down. However, total copepods went up. But again, these abundances weren't significantly different, so it doesn't seem to be a consistent signal, and we can't say that it's not natural variability. And SELPs, these did significantly decrease to post, but like I mentioned before, they're really um, episodic animals. They respond very quickly, and when we capture SELPs in our samples, it's really hard to say that the SELP is an average signal um, in general because of their lifestyle. And everything else was not significantly different. So again, no big trends to indicate that the oil is significantly impacting the system. So in conclusion, spring and summer were significantly different. Um, what is happening here, driving a lot of the underlying community structure, is there's strong northward currents and westward winds. Water's not coming into our study region or it's staying tied up on the shelf. Um, so even though there's high discharge, we're still seeing a lot of high salinities in our region, so there's not a lot of river impact. And that's contributing to these sub-regional signals, but a really strong annual signal. Whereas in summer, there's southward currents and eastward winds. The water on the shelf is getting pulled off. It's hitting other areas. Um, we're seeing impact of river discharge within our region at our sites. Oh my god, the wrong arrow. Sorry. <laughs> and this is um, contributing to advection of Mississippi River water into the region. The stuff has a lot of nutrients, has different temperatures. Um, it brings animals with it into these regions already. And this is contributing to higher chlorophyll. And also, there's just higher summertime temperatures. Um, so we saw a lot of high interannual variability likely related to these physical processes. And the higher temperature, in addition to having these nutrients, is likely contributing to faster generation times for these animals. The metabolic theory of ecology says that for invertebrates, um, they can reproduce more quickly when it's warm. So summertime, lots of nutrients, and it's warm, they're doing really well, and that's what we saw. So the oil spill, specifically, even though we did see significant differences between that pre and post data set when combined, we can't say that they're conclusive. It's likely um, limitations related to the methodology, not to mention that 2008, 2010, and 2011 were pretty non-average years when it comes to river discharge anyways. And on top of all that, the beta diversity of 2010 was not significantly different from follow-on years. Um, so something that I remember Brad Rosenheim saying once, and I know it, it applied to a different study area and it was deep sea, et cetera, but um, I think I make a fair case on mine now that if an oil spill had to occur, um, undoubtedly, you know, these animals had to have died. Like when they're exposed to oil, they suffered and they died. But 
if oil spill had to occur, um, summertime in the Gulf is the best place for it. You know, there's a lot of advection, there's a lot of complexity, these animals generate quickly, um, and they're being brought in from other areas. So if there was a signal, we just didn't see it. And um, that's potentially good news. So in conclusion, I would like to acknowledge the many entities and people and personalities that helped me get to this point. Um, especially to my committee members. I would not have been here if not for them, especially my major advisor, Dr. Daly, who has been with me throughout all of this process. And I have become such a better writer because of her. <laughs> so thank you. Also to my lab mates, Megan and Shaniqua. I couldn't have done a lot of my pre-spill stuff without them. And I could stay for another 40 minutes thanking all of you in the room for the things that you've done and contributed. Um, but Josh, Susan, Kelly, Jing, Dan, and Ben, thank you so much with large data set things, um, emotional support, computer support. I still don't know how to use a three-dimensional matrix, Jing, but thank you. Um, and of course, the USF community at large. This has been just such a wonderful experience. It's such a supportive environment. I always felt that I had people to go to and beer to drink. And I really appreciate that. And last but not least, I would like to take a moment to thank Dr. David Jones, my late committee member. Um, if not for him, I would never have known where to begin to code. And he wrote a Fathom toolbox which makes multivariate analysis, which is hard and complicated, accessible, and somewhat understandable with some work. Um, and it's open access. And if that doesn't embody what it means to stand on the shoulders of giants, I don't know what does. Um, and a little fun story. If you knew Dave, you probably remember um, his stoic calmness, but he was always puppered with like some quick wit. And so I don't know how I got brought up, but one time we were in class and um, we were just talking about stuff. There's a whole group of us, and you know, he lets out this like exasperated sigh. And we're like, what is he gonna say? Like he doesn't say a lot. And he was like, you know, if everybody just merged onto the highway, the way they zip their jackets, <laughs> it would really just solve so many traffic issues. Um, and that's just such a multivariate statistician way to look at the world. And so I hope you think of that when you merge on the highway. Um, and with that, does anyone have any questions?